Hey everybody, this is Mike Lewis from Awareness, and I, I apologize about the uh, little technical snap, but we're trying to figure out, uh, we're having some Mac versus uh, PC issues, uh, which are somewhat common, but, you know, we just want to make sure we work through everything, so we apologize about that little uh, that little jump up front. I appreciate everybody being on the call today. Um, I'm really excited about having the chance to chat with Adam this afternoon, and before I, I introduce Adam, I just wanted to cover a couple of really quick uh, logistics uh, related items with you before we get going. First thing is uh, if you have any questions uh, during the session, and we're, we'd love to have you ask as many questions as you'd like. We're really excited uh, to hear whatever it is that you have to say. Uh, the easiest way for you to ask questions is to is one of two ways. One is to either use the, uh, the Q&A feature at the bottom of WebEx, uh, which you can see right at the, the lower right-hand corner of your screen, or uh, even the, the preferred method is to participate in the conversation on Twitter. Uh, so ask any questions. Feel free to comment on anything it is that, that we're saying, whether you like it or you don't like it, uh, on Twitter using the hashtag Pound Awareness Inc. Uh, and we'll be tracking, we'll be following the uh, Twitter stream throughout the session, and, and we'll do our best to answer as many of the questions you submit as possible. Uh, anything that we don't get to or we are not able to get to during the session, uh, we'll make sure that we either catch up with you offline or, or just drop you know and let you know um, the answer if we have one. Um, on another note, if you have any issues with WebEx, any technical issues with WebEx, uh, it's really easy for you to just uh, use the support feature uh, located in the bottom right uh, just to contact WebEx directly, let them know what's happening, and they'll be able to sort out any issues that you have. So before I get in and start introducing Adam, I just want to give a quick update on who awareness is, who we are, what we do. Um, and give you some background on, on our company. Uh, a lot of people come for our webinars and want to make sure that you understand who we are and, and the value that we bring to the market. You may have heard of us. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've been making a lot of announcements uh, publicly about a couple of things, product features that we're, we're coming out with, and, as well as um, new customers that we're uh, uh, launching communities for. Um, and Adam, if you can just jump to the next slide there um, on the thing. We're actually driving from Adam's desktop today. so. Um, Essentially, we're, we're a, we're a white-label, uh, widget-based community platform. And in a nutshell, what that means is that we have a, a social media marketing platform that we can deploy for organizations who want to form their own uh, social networks, communities uh, of, of partners, customers, uh, really any audience that they're looking to go to market with. We've been in the market for, for a while. We've actually been around uh, since the late 90s. Uh, launched the newest version of the platform, launched a version of the platform in 2005 and ended up working, uh, taking on the round from uh, Greylock and Northbridge to grow out the current platform, uh, on which we've, we've launched over 200 uh, communities. We've won multiple awards and worked with some awesome customers that we've been able to do a lot of their social media marketing for and are really proud of the organizations that we've worked with. If you have a chance to, to go and check out the social networks or any of the companies uh, listed at the bottom, I encourage you to do so. Uh, they're really cool implementations of, of how some forward-thinking companies are using social media to drive uh, their, uh, as part of their marketing program. We also, I know there's a lot of marketing agencies on the line. Uh, we work with a lot of different um, um, agencies, uh, both large and small, to support the uh, technology behind the programs that they're implementing at their customers. So a great example is we do a lot of work with, with Hill Holiday for um, for uh, a site that they do for, for CVS as part of the uh, For All the Ways You Care program. Uh, we basically enable the technology to drive the campaigns that they're pitching to their customers uh, from a social standpoint. So uh, if you are an agency, I'd love to uh, take some time and chat with you off the call and let you know uh, the type of value that we provide for agencies and how we work with them on an individual basis. So just jump into the next slide. Um, one of, the, one of the differences that, that we bring to the market is we've actually, because we've worked with so many different organizations, when we, we went to productize our solution, our platform, we looked at all the implementations we had done and realized that there were really eight common use cases. We call them best practice communities. What we did was incorporate the widgets or functionality to drive the business value for each one of these use cases. That's really an important point because I think one of the areas that if you follow, you know, the blogosphere and and you're on Twitter and you're, and you're investigating things, one of the real uh, motivators behind us doing this was to actually give people the ability to track a measurable ROI for what they're doing in social media. So a lot of the, the, the use cases that we came up with were, number one, based on our experience, and number two, based on uh, the goals of our clients. We could actually build in metrics in the back end that drive an ROI based on what it is that the organization is trying to do. 
So as you can see, I, I've laid out kind of the APPCs or best practice communities along with some of the sample customers that you know, we, we work with in each one of the areas. So uh, if you'd like some more information on this, again, I'd, I'd love to take some time off the call and, and, and chat with you about those in more detail. And you know how to reach us. The easiest way is probably through Twitter. If not, you can just email us directly, and my contact information will pop up at the end and be happy to hear from you. So with that, and I promise you, that is the last sales pitch that you're going to get on the call. The rest is completely educational. And I'm really excited to have Adam on the line today. Um, I think Adam and I first met uh, over a year ago, if I'm right, at, at uh, the New Marketing yeah. Summit, which is, which is now the Inbound Marketing Summit. If you if you get really creative and want to see Adam and I talking and want to see what we both look like, you can go to YouTube and, and type in one of our names. I think that video pops up. Am I right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's been really cool. I, I've learned a lot just following Adam on on the blogosphere and, and, and hearing, you know, kind of his thoughts. And, and uh, it's, I'm really excited to have him on the line. For those of you that don't know Adam, he's a partner and, and ringleader at Circus, which is a, a new creative marketing firm that helps brands tell stories through participation and innovation using a lot of social media. And he's recognized as, a, as an expert in, you know, kind of the digital marketing and, and you know, social marketing landscape and a thought leader um, in the marketing industry. He's known for, you know, coming up with, with great marketing strategies for clients like Kraft, New York Times, Panasonic, A&E. Uh, and prior to founding Circus, Adam was the director of strategy at Crayon uh, and was also the director of emerging and creative strategy for Morpheus Media. Um, and he began his career back at Digitas working for the American Express team. Um, there's all the basic stuff about Adam, the business stuff, but for those of you who don't know, He's also uh, an avid guitar player, and he'd be happy to sing karaoke at your wedding or bar mitzvah for, of course, you know, a small fee or, or dinner or something like that. <laughs> well, we're really happy to have Adam on the line. Adam, welcome. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and thank you for adding that part in. My love, just in case the whole marketing thing doesn't work out, you know, singing at bar mitzvahs and weddings is something that is probably where I'm going to end up anyway. So thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you, everyone, and awareness for the opportunity. Um, we'll jump right in. Today we're going to talk about marketing innovation. And Mike already told you who I was. Just really briefly, a little about Circus. We are a creative marketing firm. Uh, we tell stories through participation and innovation. And we do this across a number of channels, but I'm not going to talk about Circus right now. That's not what we're here for today. If you want to contact me, I'll give you all that information. We are here today to answer Three questions, and every great presentation needs to start out with a couple of bullet points on which we're going to tackle, so here they are. We're going to talk about what innovation is, why innovation is important for marketers, and how to incorporate innovative thinking into your marketing. So we're going to start off with this handsome gentleman here, and I, I wonder how many people actually recognize this guy. Maybe a handful, maybe none. Chances are I wouldn't have recognized him either, but... This guy is responsible for coining one of my favorite definitions of innovation. And innovation is something that is important to me both professionally and personally. So for those of you who didn't know, uh, that guy was John Emerling, and his definition of innovation is creativity with a job to do. And that is what we're going to use as the premise for today's talk. There are certainly a lot of definitions of innovation out there. I particularly like this, that one, but we're going to use that one for our talk today. So, hey, Adam, this I is Mike. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to give one no, thing. Like there's, there's some chat going on on Twitter. Uh, some can talk okay. around the, the hashtag for the event. So just, to be, just to clarify, uh, the hashtag is Pound Awareness Inc. Uh, just so everybody knows, it's not Awareness123. Sorry about that. Not a problem at all. So, I think that there is a common misperception that somehow innovation is inextricably linked to technology. And while technology can certainly help fuel innovation, it's not core to what innovation actually is. Now, in Emerling's definition that we just saw, technology isn't even mentioned, and it's not really mentioned in most definitions of innovation. And when I think about innovation when I'm working on a project, I do my best to keep technology as the final strategic link, which is not always easy to do. I, I certainly recognize that there are client pressures and the ever-popular lure of shiny objects. And I, I'm certainly not saying that technology doesn't play a role in innovation, but I think that a lot of us in the marketing world, 
gradually, increasingly in the last five years, are beginning to get carried away with technology and begin to use it for its own sake, forgetting that there is no substitute for creative ideas. So when I was asked to give this talk today, I thought it would be a great opportunity to address some of the positive and some of the negative things I see happening in the world of marketing, particularly as it relates to innovation. So before we get fully in, I want to talk about why innovation. Because I think that innovation is very important for marketers. And I certainly see a, a lot of exciting, innovative things happening in the world of marketing. But on the flip side, I'm sad to say that I, I think I see a greater degree of complacency and status quo as well as forced uses of technology with the real strategic core. And given my passion for this industry, it, you know, it kind of saddens me that there are people just going through the motions or looking for that next flash in the pan technology to exploit their motivation for innovation. So I worry that some of these people that fail to look at every opportunity to innovate, that some of these people will be out of work soon. So an interesting statistic here, and just so you know, this statistic was actually pulled in the year 2000 uh, from a great book called Winning a New Product. But this statistic was pulled in the year 2000, and essentially 40% of major corporations are now out of business, within the span of 25 years, went out of business. They no longer exist. And some may think that this statistic is somehow tied to an inability to deal with new technology, and I would disagree. I believe that the companies reflect that here failed due to the lack of innovation, not an inability to keep up with technology. Now, new technology certainly plays a role in the, in these companies, but only in the sense that being unaware of new technology can stunt your ability to innovate. And earlier I mentioned that technology should not be the motivation for innovation, but the exponential rate at which technology is changing is constantly challenging us to re-examine the way we as a society live. Things are changing every day, and we're changing the way that we live and the way that society grows. And when you think about the growth of social computing, over the last five years, even over, over the last two years, it's inevitable that technology will change everything that we do, including marketing. Still, technology itself should not be the focus, which brings us to the central focus of today's talk, the role of innovation in marketing. So, innovation is a marketing's job, right? I bet when most of you took your job, whether it be marketer, agency executive, brand manager, Innovation was not at the top of your job description. More traditionally minded marketers may not even consider innovation as a mandate. After all, our job as marketers is to tell a story about a product or service. As marketers, the product is out of our hands, right? Well, maybe not. I personally believe that modern marketing must be more closely tied to product and that innovative marketing programs can add to a product beyond its intrinsic value. And as such, my partner, John Swords, and I created Circus to focus on two core principles we believe are central to the current state of all marketing. As I mentioned before, these two core principles are participation and innovation. And given that innovation is so core to what we do, we've actually developed a way of thinking about innovation and a process to ensure that we're constantly doing our best to innovate. And you see it here, it's ICO, which stands for Innovation Creates Opportunity. So it's a fairly straightforward process. There's a, a stage followed by a gate or a filter. And at each stage, you have the chance to ensure that you have completed what was in the previous stage. Pretty straightforward. Now, this is the model that Circus uses, but you can create your own model for innovation. We're using this as a template today, but without some type of framework of checks and balances, what tends to happen, and I'm sure that you've all seen this, is that people fall in love with their own ideas, and they rush to the finish line, untethered, without an obligatory check-in. So if someone has a great idea, they think, it, and it could very well be a great idea. But there are still the necessary checks and balances that you need to go through in order to get this idea to market. So that's what the gates serve to do. They ensure you're periodically checking your thinking and not 
simply moving ahead aimlessly. So uh, I think that people on the line who have been in product development have seen this type of philosophy before. And this is actually the try this at home slide. So consider your current processes. And if you haven't established an ideation process with iterative checks, checks and balances, see if you can't fit this or some other type of model into the way that you work. And then let me know how it goes. I'd love to hear. So let's get into stage one. And stage one is a needs-based assessment. And it's fairly straightforward. So the framework allows to validate your thinking. So at stage one, the essential questions are asked. What are we trying to accomplish? How can we add value to the consumers? How can we involve the consumers? And others based on the initiative, but it's very important that this stage is done. And when things like this are not, or questions like this are not asked, I see campaigns that come out looking like something that I wrote about back in March, actually. It's a, a reverse Cinderella type story in which a beautiful girl finds the man of her dreams loses track of him and is left only with his jacket. She creates a blog, a YouTube channel, and other content that's made to look like user-generated content. So this was leveraging all of the social media channels what was popular at the time. Now, in the end, the story turns out to be nothing more than a hoax in the campaign for Australian clothing company Witchery. Now, I guess the, the first rule is that, you know, don't lie to your consumers, but what really bothered me about this is that it was apparent that the creators of this initiative were trying to employ every buzz tactic imaginable, but it's also obvious that they did not ask the questions that we saw on the previous slide. Now, some of you may have been saying, well, stage one, that's pretty obvious. So, you know, we, we already do that, but not everyone does it, which is why I feel that it's important to stress these things, which brings us to the next stage, which is storytelling. And in this second stage, we talk about storytelling without any reference to technology. And the question needs to be asked, what is the story we're trying to tell? And how can we activate consumers to participate? Now, I believe that it's much easier to remember a story you were involved in than one that was merely told to you. And it's more likely, and I think most people on the call today would agree with this, that it's more likely that you're going to repeat a story that you were involved in but over one that was simply told to you. So on this next slide here, actually, when I was putting the presentation together, my business partner, John Sword, showed me this quote, and having never heard of it before, or the author, and I didn't really know the context, uh, I wasn't really sure what was intended by this statement, but I loved it, and it fit perfectly into this talk. I wasn't sure where, so I put it here, but I see this statement, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. I see this statement as an advocation of the formula, art, over science. And speaking of art, the third phase goes into the actual toolkit. Now, this is obviously a crucial phase of any initiative, or stage of any initiative, but it's imperative that the roadmap and the story are developed before the toolbox is even open. The result of not thinking that approach and peeking into the toolbox prematurely like the boy on the slide here is, in my opinion, a campaign that looks something like this. Now, I recently saw this campaign, and this campaign employs augmented reality, which is something that Circus is working on right now, actually working on an initiative that will go live in about two weeks. Uh, can't talk about it yet, but um, I, I promise to call your attention to it when it does launch. So, on the Circus, one may think that this campaign, if, you, if you've seen it, you might have thought that this campaign was innovative. And essentially what it is, that for those of you not familiar with augmented reality, I won't go into depth, but in this instance, what you do is you print out a piece of paper, you hold it up to your webcam, and out comes this 3D movie poster. Now, when you really look at this campaign and think about it, this is nothing more than old ideas exploiting new technology. That, to me, is not innovation. Now, I may sound a little frustrated with this, and my real issue here, because it's no skin off my back, people create campaigns that are not innovative every day, but my real issue is the potential to tarnish people's perception of a technology that can otherwise have creative uses. So that was my issue when I saw this. Now, 
Let's move into the final stage of the process, which I feel is most compelling. Traditionally, marketing initiatives had a start and an end date. Now, many of you, I'm sure, on the line right now who have been following the social media space have accepted the idea that there is life beyond campaign time parameters. And I, I certainly subscribe to that idea. That as marketers, we need to begin to think beyond the campaign. But I think this notion goes beyond what well, today we're referring to as social media. I think it goes into all media and marketing. Great initiatives, in my opinion, should provision for some lasting value for consumers, creating the opportunity for a brand to continually stay connected in some type of dialogue. Now, here's a campaign that I think does a great job of it. Some of you may have seen it. It's called Dunk and Run. And, I, you know, I have to admit, I wasn't sure about this campaign when I first saw it, but I really grew to love it. And what I love about this initiative, and I'll give some details for those who have not seen it, but what I really love about this initiative is it creates a new ritual around donut consumption. And while technology plays a role in this ritual, it's by being central to the ritual. The real central element in this initiative is social experience. So I will give you some of the details here for those that haven't seen the campaign. And I'm going to actually just read from the site a little bit. So the dunk and run is the easiest way to grab a delicious pick-me-up. Here's how it works. Invite. Start a run at Duncan.com from your computer, mobile device, iPhone app. You are now the runner. Pick which friend you want to invite by providing either their email or mobile number. Then order. Select what you want from the menu and we'll contact your friends and tell them to do the same. The third step is run. Go get the goods. We'll compile all the orders and you can print it out and have it sent to your mobile device. And when you print it out, you can actually just hand it to the Duncan crew, and they'll take care of it and finally enjoy it. Bring back the goodies and enjoy the deliciousness along with the hero worship from your friends. Now, I thought that that piece was great. So Duncan Donuts created this new ritual around donut consumption and getting the act of getting donuts and made an office hero out of the person that initiates it. I thought that that was really cool. Now, this is powered by technology. There are certainly a lot of technologies used to get this done. But they are not what makes it innovative. Another example that I really love is EcoDrive. Now, this is not in America right now. Some of you may have heard of it and some of you may not have. And I will go to some, into some specifics to this, but this campaign would certainly not have been possible at all with technology. Some of you actually may think it's ironic that I downplayed technology at the beginning and I seem to be harping on it, but there's a reason for that. But we'll get into that in a minute. So this campaign wouldn't have been possible without technology, but it would not have been relevant if there were not a job to do. And in our definition of, of innovation for today, we said that innovation was creativity with a job to do. So there's a job to do in this campaign. So here are some of the highlights really quick. So EcoDrive is actually a software application that can be installed on your computer. And as you're driving, EcoDrive processes in detail everything relating to the vehicle's efficiency and your driving characteristics. And through the USB port, all of the data is transmitted via, uh, via USB key, and you can see it on your computer. The driver, and I'm going to read a little from the site here, uh, the driver can analyze consumption and emission on each journey, and they make uh, uh, they make uh, called the Eco Index and receive advice on how to drive in order to create less impact on the environment. There are tutorials that can help drivers achieve CO, uh, uh, reduce their CO2 emissions by up to 15 percent, which is really cool. Now, for these Eco drivers, something was created called Ecoville, which is an online community dedicated to eco-responsible driving. Now, we all know that a lot of brands are beginning to create communities nowadays, and our gracious host awareness is helping to power a lot of them, and they didn't ask me or pay me to say that, but it is true. So, while I think that branded communities can be effective, it takes more than just a platform to make a community successful. You will remember a quote from a few slides back, I said, um, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. Well, Communities are made of people, not technology. 
And people need to have a reason to interact, whether it be shared interests, common goals. And that's exactly what Fiat created here with EcoBuild. Now, if you go to the site, um, ecodrive.com, there's a, a flash intro where the statement is made that the technology is complex, but the result is simple. And that's really at the heart of what we're talking about today. And I, I really love that statement. The technology is complex, but the result is simple. And I think that innovative uses of technology should be able to almost obscure the technology and almost make the technology seem human and perform in ways that feel like it was supposed to be that way. So the technology is not what is front and center, but the creativity, the ideas, and the results are what is front and center. But talk is cheap, and I think that this campaign shows us that marketing can be about doing, not just about talking. There are a lot of companies out there that are talking green. There are other companies that are raising money for the environment, which is great. But here's an initiative that's actually delivering solutions and leveraging community to get the job done. Somewhere on the site, it actually says the savings grow as the community grows. How often is that? The savings grow as the community grows. So they're actually putting a price for how much we can help the environment based on the importance of community. I love it. Incidentally, this campaign won uh, Grand Prix of Ten this year, and I have mixed feelings about ad awards, but in this case, it was certainly well-deserved. And it's probably not a coincidence that Fiat was named Business Week's Top 50 Innovative Companies of 2009. Now, it wasn't tied directly to this campaign, but I'm sure that this had something to do with it. So in short, there are alternatives to innovation. But in my estimation or my opinion, they're not very attractive. I feel that 2009 is a great year to be a marketer. Our toolkit for creativity has never been larger, and our canvas has never been more global. And one thing that really annoys me and I'm sure that some of you have said this and some of you have heard this. I've probably said it, but I've stopped. One thing that really annoys me is when people say, this is just marketing. We're not saving lives. As if what we're doing is not important. Now, this may be true that we're not saving lives for what it is we're doing, marketing, social marketing. But if this is really your attitude, you might be in the wrong field because you might not be saving lives, but with the ability to innovate to the point where you're shaping culture, you definitely have the ability to change lives. With that, I'm going to leave you with a statement from a great musician, John Cage. I can't understand why people are frightened of new ideas. I'm frightened of the old ones. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Adam Boyd, and by all means, if you saw something in here that you liked, that you didn't like, you want to challenge me, you want to discuss, shoot me an email at Adam at Circus, or get me on Twitter at Adam Boyd. Thank you very much. Wow, thanks, Adam. That's great. So before we get to the Q&A, we have a bunch of questions that already came in. Um, I wanted to do a couple things real quick with everybody. First, uh, just remind everybody that if you have any questions, feel free to Shoot them in using the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of WebEx. I am monitoring everything. I've tried to respond to as many of you during the session as I could, as well as anybody that's out on uh, Twitter. Feel free to drop us a, uh, a tweet, and we will get to that as well. We already have a bunch to get started with. But before I go forward, I want to let you know about a couple of uh, the next four sessions we have coming up. We're actually um, booked up having people on through uh, September 22nd. We have some really cool, um, exciting um Yes, that we're going to be having on the show or the, or the webinar series here in the next couple of months. Uh, starting off with Mike Volpe. If you don't know Mike, he's a, he's a CMO of a company called HubSpot. And I don't work for HubSpot. I don't, uh, in, you know, I don't sell their product or anything like that. But if you haven't checked out HubSpot, I recommend you do. It's uh, www.hubspot.com. They're doing some really cool, innovative stuff, uh, both from a marketing perspective as well as from, you know, their technology itself. I think it's some pretty cool stuff. So we're going to have Mike on, and we're going to be chatting with him on August 26th. It's actually, that should be August 26th. We have to change the date. We're going to have uh, Chris Brogan on the line, and that's just a couple days after he comes out with his brand-new book, um, his first book, actually, 
called Trust Agents. So he's going to be talking about trust agents and uh, going through, I'm sure, a whole bunch of other stuff um, that that will uh, be pretty cool. So he's going to be on August 26th. Uh, Larry Weber, uh, if you're familiar, if you're from the agency world, you're, you're, you know who Larry Weber is. He's the founder of Weber Shandwick. Uh, he's currently the chairman of Digital Influence Group. Uh, Larry just came out with a new book himself called Sticks and Stones, and he's going to be joining us on September 10th. And on September 22nd, we have Joe Trippi. And a lot of people have asked, about who Joe Trippi is, and I was kind of surprised. Uh, for those of you who don't know Joe, Joe is actually the guy who did all the social media for the Howard Dean campaign back when they first launched. And at the time, you remember, it was it was a pretty innovative thing. Um, the way they had actually gone out and raised campaign funds was something that just hadn't been done in politics anymore. And actually set the stage for what we saw in the last election with Barack Obama uh, and his use of social media. A lot of the stuff actually came from Joe Trippi. So he's actually a thought leader in the in the political uh, social media space. I'm really excited to have him on the line. Um, if you don't follow me on Twitter, I think it's just Joe Trippy uh, on Twitter. So uh, feel free to uh, register for any of those at awarenessnetworks.com or right on the homepage. Uh, feel free to click on it and get a quick overview of what people are going to be talking about and then register and hope you can come back. Um, do I have another slide in there, Adam, or is that it? One more. One more? That's it? Oh, that's the one. Yeah, I <laughs> You need to get in touch with us. This is what this is how you get in touch with either Adam or I. Um, again, any questions that you have um, now, feel free to jump on on Twitter and or you know through WebEx, and we'll get to all. So, so first things first, Adam. The uh, a bunch of questions came up kind of around um, budget, and I don't want to talk about budget specifically yet. But I thought one of the interesting things that that people have been talking about is when you're marketing in a down economy. Marketers tend to be less uh, willing to take risks. And I'm wondering how much of that you see and how much of that actually translates into a lack of, may, or maybe a perceived lack of, of innovation right now. Right, right. So, I mean, I, I have to admit, well, we've been fortunate enough to be working on some great projects and get some great deals. Um, you know, I haven't really seen that to a large degree. I certainly read about it in the trades that people are pulling back dollars. But it's not really a risk when you propose creativity and when you propose something that is laid out in a way that I laid it out here. So it's very risky to walk in somewhere and say, here's our big social media idea or here's our big new technology and they're using, you know, X widget, I mean that in the old sense of the word, but, you know, to invest in that is probably risky. But I think that even in a down economy, when you have done your strategic planning and when you've done your upfront work and you come in with a creative idea, and you've also come in with ideas for course correction. So you have contingency plans and you say, well, if this happens, this is going to happen. But I think it's a lot easier for people to feel comfortable taking advantage of innovative thinking. And I think that's, you know, we all say that, you know, the down economy is the time to invest. You've heard people say that. You know, I don't really know if that's true. I mean, maybe if I went through the Depression, I would know that. But, uh, you know, I don't really know if that's true. But, no, no, I, I have a couple years I missed it. But I, I would say that, you know, even now, smart people are looking for creative ideas. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I think, you know, one of, one of the things that, that that's come up, I think, and, and it's more maybe, and, you know, if you put social media and, and you talk about how companies are kind of less, um, some companies, I should say, are, are kind of taking the old school thought that, yeah, they're not sure, do we do this, do we not do it? It's, it's kind of that risk versus reward thing. And, and what I mean by that is marketers know what the results, for the most part, are going to be from an email campaign. They know what they're going to do from, you know, the ads that they run. They've been able to collect all this data, and all of a sudden this new thing comes along. You know, it's called social media or, or digital marketing in general. And it becomes a little more risky for them to actually say, all right, I'm going to allocate X percent of my marketing budget to this thing that I'm not sure how it's going to go, uh, especially difficult in a down economy after after budgets have been cut. Right. Right. You know, you know what's funny about that is that people will continue to invest in things they know aren't working, so right. they might pull dollars back from, say, social media or newer types of marketing, and they might dump them into, you know, banners on uh, on big sites 
they know they're only going to get a 1% at best, maybe 2% click-through rate. So it's amazing how in the economy, people go to what they know, but those things are not necessarily things that work, which is kind of interesting to me. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. So talk a little bit about the budget then behind behind innovation. You know, it's hard to start to do this, and I completely agree. I think everybody on the line, you know, agrees that, you know, it's, it's a great time to be a marketer, that there's a lot of innovative stuff that, that we can do. Um, talk a little bit about the budget behind actually coming up with innovative concepts. I mean, I don't know how much research that, that you guys have done to it, but there's a lot of questions about, you know, how much money should we put in? Is there a specific amount? Is there an allocation, you know, behind the innovative stuff that we're trying to do? Right. So, I mean, you know, there are, there are your textbooks to put X amount into marketing. You know, some people in business might say 8% of your, of your gross revenue goes towards marketing. And I, again, I don't really know, uh, I've never worked for a company that spoke in those terms. And if, but if you're going to use those terms, if you want to say 8%, maybe, you know, 0.2, uh, goes to innovation, it's really hard to say. But what I would say is, depending on the size of your budget and your ability to have initiatives that encompass many different elements, and what I mean by that is, a great idea can be executed in many ways. So let's say you're bringing an idea to a client, and you have a really great idea that can be executed both via banner ads and social media, or something that people might think is newer to be able to hedge the risk and to be able to say, well, you know, we're also running this in tandem will help people better make an estimate on how much they can put towards innovation. But it's a, that is a very, I have to admit, that's a very difficult question. I, I think you, anyone would be hard-pressed to, um, to answer that with a number. But I would say, you know, definitely continually come up with great ideas and the budget should follow. Absolutely. No, I agree with that, too. And we just got an interesting um, – it came into the Q&A button. It's not on Twitter, but someone wrote in, and, and I think it's a great it's a great point. She, she said that I agree that it's a great time to be a marketer, but I have to say I'm seeing hundreds of marketers out of jobs, and my job hunt in, marketing, in the marketing field becomes more frustrating every day. I think top management doesn't realize how great a time it is. And I, I would – I would agree with that. I think that's kind of true, especially at, the, at some of the larger organizations that I've worked with. And I don't know if you're seeing the same thing. Yeah. Well, I would say to that person, shoot me an email, you know, if you're, if you're not working right now, um, by all means, because uh, I think that right now is the opportunity where, you know, we saw this, my partner and I saw this in this, in this economy, we saw this as the opportunity to go out and with lower overhead to be able to do the same type of executions in terms of level of creativity or less money, allowing us to be more experimental and do more innovative things. So, yes, a lot of people are are being laid off. You know, I know it's a, it's a terrible thing. I've gone through it. And that part of it is not a great – doesn't make it a great time to be a marketer. But, you know, I, I think where you're faced with uh, adversary, there's, there's also opportunity. And, you know, people are starting businesses. I can't tell you how many people have told me that they're starting a business now. I feel like I hear it every day. And I love it. And I think that, you know, not to get uh, very patriotic, but what it means to be an American, the ability to lose your job and then go out and say, okay, I lost my job. Now I'm starting a business. So marketer, business, whatever you're doing, I, I just, you know, I, I think that, yes, it's a bad time in terms of money, but I think it's a great time in terms of opportunity all around. Uh, yeah, I agree with that, too. And, Christina, if you're listening, um, I think you just got an opening to send Adam your resume. So feel free to, you too. to drop him a note. You can send it over to us as well. I'd love to, love to see it and see if there's anything we can help you out with. Um, another question came in about the, really the goals of innovation. And, and the way that I'm going to read is exactly the person put it, um, and then add a little color maybe to the end of it, but what if innovation doesn't actually drive sales? What does it become then? Or in it, and in the color I'd add is if it's not sales, if there's another objective that you have behind the program or, or what you're doing in marketing, uh, if it doesn't answer that, what, what happens then? Right. So I don't know if I could go back if people still have their screens up here, but I will uh, just go back really quick because I think that's a great question. What if it doesn't drive sales? Well, 
Uh, it's around here somewhere, if I know this presentation. So you'll see the way we have it laid out here is the first stage in innovation is a need-based assessment. So you can be innovative and at the same time ensure that you're driving towards sales, but that needs to happen at the beginning. And if you do a proper needs-based assessment, so you do, you know, you go through everything that you're up against at that time and cross-check that with your goals, then that should put you on the course to, you know, it doesn't really matter what goals. I'm not saying what needs fall into that first stage. And if sales fit into that needs-based assessment, then there are certainly innovative ways to get there. But you need to ask the right questions up front. Absolutely. And an interesting quote just came in from Twitter. Um, Canadians are out there doing startups too, Adam, just so you know. So there's, there's a big shout out to all the Canadians. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> well, I, 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 I do apologize for that. <laughs> in full disclosure, awareness was actually founded up in Canada. So, um, gotcha. I actually have an office up in Toronto. So, um, my yeah, apologies okay. to Canada. No, they're, they're starting companies up there too. So, uh, I, I, also, the same person actually wrote something interesting before that I wanted to get your comments on. It was, and here's the quote. And I, I personally have a, you know, a, a bias for this because, you know, I do stand up every once in a while. I'm a fledgling stand up comic, but improv and comedy are the basics in formulating a fun and engaging campaign. Is that accurate, do you think? Improv and comedy. Improv and comedy. Um, I, are, are the basics? Uh, can you just say, are the basics for what? What was that again? Are the, are, basics? are the basics in formulating a fun and engaging campaign? I would say that, I don't, I don't know if they are the basics. I would say improv and comedy, you know, throwing ideas out. I would say that those certainly play a very important role. What I would say, though, and in this model here is when you're done with the improv and comedy portion, which I would probably put into the storytelling, the, the second phase I have here, just make sure that at the end of that stage, you run it through a gate. And by gate, I set that up as a filter that is a set of questions or criteria. So, yes, improv, comedy, I mean, this is, you know, people like to have fun in their jobs and campaigns. Just make sure that you run it through that filter and make sure that the output is something that is going to be fortuitous and going to make the campaign better. I don't think that improv and comedy alone make a campaign successful. I agree. Yeah, I can't. I, I, I completely agree. I just want to get your reaction to what, what was written in there. Um, just got another, uh, another cool question here. Adam, are you, are you finding that consumers demand more innovative marketing in that they prefer to be part of the conversation versus just being shown in a static banner ad or, or you know, an advertiser in a magazine or something like that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, the two examples that I showed today, uh, the Duncan Run and Eco Drive are, are both, from what I can see and what I'm reading in the media, very successful. And I don't have their parallels in campaigns that are um, you know, unidirectional. So in the, the Duncan Run campaign, everyone is involved, from the Duncan employee to everyone in your office. And it's fun, and as I said, it's a, a ritual based around donuts. And I actually, my, my friend Jen Kim from Sigma, she's on the line, hello. She, she actually told me that she loves Duncan Run. It's great. They, it's actually something that they do in their office. Uh, I live in Manhattan. It's not as useful for me. But it really became apparent that it was great when I was in talking to Jen and some other people. And I saw how it delighted them to actually be involved in the campaign. So by all means, the answer is 100 yeses. Do you know if they, do you know if they've actually put out any stats on the results of the campaign so far? I do not. I don't know. I, I believe that Dunkin Donuts, their digital stuff is handled by Hill Holiday, who you're working with. I'm not sure about that. I, I think that is the case, but, um, so you are probably closer to them than I am if that is the case. <laughs> I haven't seen any stats. You know, I kind of follow certain campaigns and, I try and uh, get what you can. Oftentimes, you don't see real stats. You see anecdotes and fluff. And, I, you know, I mean, that's, uh, people don't want to give away the secret sauce necessarily, so I haven't seen it. But in, in hearing, you know, 
anecdotal evidence of people, because when the way, you look at the way people talk about marketing in general, it's largely negative, uh, at least consumers, people not in the industry. When you get people outside of the industry smiling and saying they like something, that is a, an indication of good things. Yeah, no, that's definitely a good thing. We need all the support we can get. That's yeah. great. <laughs> um, this is a question that came on Twitter and just showed up again, and, and uh, I was going to ask it next anyway, but just showed up in the WebEx thing. It's from Alan, and he asked, uh, he asked if he could comment on the true difference between in innovation between the Duncan Run app and the uh, the one on augmented reality that he showed earlier. And the, the reason he's asking is he sees both as kind of both cool novel campaign ideas, but he sees them both as using new technology for something that's already been done before. Right. Well, I would then, you know, in terms of using new technology for something that's already been done before, um, you know, people have been able to group order donuts, mm -hmm. but what they created was this ritual of doing it, and they created an office hero, and this notion of office hero. So while that may seem a little vacuous, it's, it's a fun, playful way to buy donuts. And it creates what I see as a new ritual. So emailing, getting call, getting a, a text, or getting an email that allows you to place your order in a, a wholly new way to do it. I mean, certainly people have placed group orders before, but this is a really a wholly new way to do it. it makes it easier, makes it more fun, and involves everyone. Whereas in the gamer situation, it really is just holding up a piece of paper and seeing a billboard. Now, it's a cooler way to see a billboard, and I, uh, you know, that is certainly a great question because I can see where the, the similarities would be drawn, but nothing new was achieved in that gamer, um, in that gamer initiative. It was simply using technology to employ old ideas. Yeah, because in, in essence, you were just creating another movie poster, right? Exactly. And um, I, I have an idea who asked that question. Just from the first name you said and, and the, the fact that it was such a good question, I have a guess in my head who asked that question. It's a great question. I think there are fine lines between these things, but, um, you know, uh, group ordering of donuts is one thing, but a ritual around donuts that has hero worship and all of these new elements bring it to life in a, a wholly new way, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I, I absolutely agree. And I'm wondering, you mentioned mobile, um, you know, as part of the Dump and Run uh, program. Do you see that as an area to focus on for innovation? And that actually came from Ron on uh, Twitter. Yeah, I think mobile is tremendous. I just, um, you know, I think when people say mobile, they, they tend to focus on mobile devices like the iPhone. And like, like the iPhone period, maybe with a, you know, an afterthought of Android, that's what people tend to refer to. I think the opportunity for mobility as a, as a concept and reaching people and messaging them with time and place as part of the contextual puzzle is absolutely tremendous. And I think that is going to become increasing as more people have smarter devices, and not just mobile phones, but netbooks and other devices that can connect with GPS coordinates and other elements. I think that is going to enable things like dunk and run and other very creative uses of technology to achieve new types of campaigns. And do you see, are a lot of your clients asking for more down the mobile path? Yeah, I think that there are some that are asking for it by name. I think there are some people that are saying we want to be doing more in mobile, and there are some that realize that this is the way their consumers are beginning to act and say we need to reach our consumers in the new way that they're living. And the implication there for a lot of consumers is that people are spending more time on mobile phones. I'll use mobile phones for this because they are spending more time on mobile phones, mobile devices than they are on the PC. So by all means, more people are asking for it, are talking about it, whether, um, you know, explicitly or implicitly. So what part what part of innovation and all the stuff that you talked about, and this is a very general question, so maybe 
difficult answer, but it's, it's a good one, I think. Um, what part of all this relates to B2B? And and because a lot of the examples, and I think this is kind of, it's a lot easier sometimes, you know, for, and I, you know, I think we, we all do it. Because the consumer examples are out there, um, they're very easy to talk about because we all see them every day. Can you, do you know of any in the B2B space of, of companies that are doing really innovative stuff? Um, right. So you you always have the B2B question, and I should be more prepared for the B2B. <laughs> uh, I, I, should, I should just have one in my back pocket. Cause you know you're going to get that question because it is much more challenging. And you see examples of innovative campaigns for consumers all the time. And every day you see a new campaign from Kristen Porter, Burger King, something that blows your mind. And it's very difficult to do things on that scale or with that bravado in the B2B space. Now, off the top of my head right now, I'm at a loss for something in particular, but I find creativity and innovation in small things as well. I think people, I said in my talk that people link um, innovation with technology. I think that people link innovation with larger-than-life examples of campaigns, and you can innovate even in the way that you do a presentation, right, in the way that you speak. And, you know, there are innovative ways to message from business to business that I may not know about them because they're not big, sexy campaigns. So I probably can dig and find one, but I would have to think, and I'm not working in a B2B environment right now, uh, but I would have to think, well, I am on uh, one thing, but um, and I like to think that we're being very creative, with the job to do, but, um, you know, I have to think that there are examples that are, are closer to the ones that I showed here in the B2B space, and so maybe I'll do some digging and uh, put them up on Twitter when I find them. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so what, I, I got two more questions in here, and I will, uh, first, uh, Christina asked if we could put that last slide up again. I think she's looking for your contact information. Oh, um, sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no problem. Good question from Olga uh, that, that we, we've gotten on a few uh, different different sections, and you know, so we'll get your take on it too. What resources do you recommend for you know young marketers who are just starting out in order to deliver the highest value of social marketing campaigns? What resources do I recommend? Well, I mean, you know, this I got to go back to old faithful on this one, and this is probably what just about every social marketer would say. And, um, you know, I like to be creative in my answers. But, you know, there's really no substitute for being involved. So, you know, if you don't have a blog, if you're not on Twitter, um, you know, my new favorite thing is phosphorus. It seems to be everyone's, you know. And I, I think that if you're getting into the industry, obviously there's reading all the blogs and, you know, reading all the texts that are, are constantly coming out. But there really is no substitute for creating content and creating content that is meant to evoke conversation. And I wish I had something, you know, more you need to say, but that is the truth. I feel everything I learned about blogging, I learned from just doing it. I mean, there, you know, when I started doing it, there weren't books, to my knowledge. And, um, you know, I learned a lot about blogging by doing it. And I, you know, that is the best advice. And still, even after hearing that advice so many times, I find people saying to me, well, I just don't have time to do it. And my answer then is then, well, you, maybe you don't really want to do it because there is time. And if that's your career and that's what you want to do, then you have to make time. Mm -hmm. Well, Adam, I really appreciate you taking some time with us today. Um, my pleasure. Fact, we're, absolute, we're at 3 o'clock. I want to thank everybody that's online. Um, if... Uh, just for those of you left, I just want to remind you that we will be making the slides available. Uh, give me, it'll probably be early Monday that we'll have both the slides and the recording as well as the podcast of the Q&A uh, up on the site, and you'll be able to download them. We'll send out an email to everybody that was on the call today just to let them know. But uh, thank everybody on the line, and especially thanks, Ed. Thanks, Adam. We really appreciate you taking some time. My pleasure. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.